Episode 95 The trees are my elders, their cyclical change tangible proof that it's okay to grow, shine, be our true selves and let go. It's always been the natural order of things, and now they have shared their gilded wisdom. It may look like trees, we stuck and don't see so much. I've learned it's in the pause that we receive all the gifts this life has to offer. Thank you, Jen Millette. Northern lights in the Rhode Island skies, sparkling lights on the streets of Patuxet, shine your light. This is the Patuxet General. Greetings and welcome into the Patuxet General. I am your host, Jess. This week I have something to say about a local fish protected here but can be found legally in season in Connecticut and New York. They may have a lot of bones, but they also have a deep impact on Revolutionary War history. Also, serve yourself a tall coffee or tea and enjoy a large bite of Edgar Allan Poe's The Murders in the Rue Morgue. But before we do that, I must shout out to Jen, one of our Patreon subscribers, who came to visit us at the pop-up store at the Edgewood Congregational Church, 9 till 1 last Saturday. She got to take advantage of the free Cookies for Patreons who pop in promotion and get a free pack of chocolate chunk cookies. Thanks for popping in, Jen. Look for her poetry in episodes 25, 42, 44, 88, and today, or on her blog, healinginsights.blog. Speaking of Patreons, these foul-weather friends have stuck with us through the rain, hail, driving wind, and deep snow, without whom we would be up the Patuxet without a paddle. If you would like to support the General this holiday season so that we can continue to give you entertaining content, there are several ways to do that. You could order pies or other baked goods for pickup on Saturdays by emailing us at jess at patuxetgeneral.com. Or you could make a one-time donation by clicking the link in the show notes. Or become a Patreon subscriber for a small monthly amount to receive special content and gifts only receivable from the General at patreon.com. Or simply follow the link in the show notes. Also, Next week starts a whole month of holiday desserts. I'll find unusual ones to surprise your loved one and bring smiles all around. But for right now, let's get started with a very special fish. American shad is underrated as a fish nowadays, but this local diadromous delicacy is also a hero. Folklore surrounding this fish explores the expanse of bones by explaining it was a porcupine turned inside out or even that the creator used all the spare bones on the other fish and only had tiny ones left for the shad. But the fish is known mostly for saving George Washington's army from starvation at Valley Forge. We've all heard how tough and cold it was in that encampment. But thanks to an early spawning run, the shad broke their hunger and helped win the American Revolutionary War. Once a year in Connecticut, they have shad bakes, that being the state fish there. And in New York, you can catch five shad per angler. But here in Patuxet Village, we do not allow you to fish for them yet. The Patuxet River Authority had this to say. Since 2001, the Patuxet River Authority has pursued the restoration of fish to the river which live in the ocean, but must come to fresh water to reproduce or spawn. These species, native to New England, are the alewife, the blueback herring, the American shad, and the American eel. The Atlantic salmon and striped bass are also part of this group, but to date, do not prefer Rhode Island fresh waters to spawn. 
Before European settlers came to North America, all these species traveled into the Patuxent system. However, due to the creation of dams and discharge of pollutants during the Industrial Revolution in New England, during the late 1700s throughout the 1800s, and continuing into the 1900s, these species were either unable to access the river or could not tolerate the degraded water quality of the Patuxent. Since 1972, the water quality of the Patuxent has been improving. In 2011, the Patuxent River Authority removed a dam at the mouth of the Patuxent. That project, along with stocking by Rydem, has allowed the number of these species to return and populate the first seven miles of the river for the first time in over 200 years. So perhaps soon we may be able to try this recipe for plank shad made the way Washington may have had it. You will need one large plank stuck sturdily into the ground, one large American shad, four nails, black pepper, dried cayenne, rosemary, dried thyme. Portuguese salt was used at Mount Vernon, so it was probably what Washington preferred in general. The first step is to scale the fish, then cut open the belly and remove the innards. With a sharp knife, split the rib going down the middle on the inside so that it spreads open into a butterflied cut. Give it a good rinse, and then season with salt, pepper, cayenne, rosemary, and dried thyme. Next, nail your fish to the board and start a fire in front to both cook and smoke the fish for about an hour or until flaky. Carefully remove the bones and either eat this way, yum, or make into fish cakes, also yum. I've had trout this method if you can't get shad, and it's amazing. Enjoy either way. I want to tell you about my friend Mike and his electromagnetic pinball museum and restoration arcade. It's an all-inclusive place to relax and share anything related to modern pinball, EM pinball, and arcade games. A group of pinball and arcade fans with an addiction to games of all kinds and Lego too. $10 gets you free play on pinball and arcade games all day. You can find them at 881 Main Street, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, or online at www.electromagneticpinballmuseum.com. And now for the continued reading, The Murders in the Rue Morgue by Edgar Allan Poe. Not long after this, we were looking over an evening edition of the Gazette de Tribunaux when the following paragraphs arrested our attention. Extraordinary murders. This morning at around three o'clock, the inhabitants of the Quartier Saint Roche were aroused by sleep by a succession of terrific shrieks issuing apparently from the fourth story of a house in the Rue Morgue, known to be in the sole occupancy of one Madame L'Espagne and her daughter, Mademoiselle Camille L'Espagne, after some delay, occasioned by a fruitless attempt to procure admission in the usual manner, the gateway was broken in with a crowbar. Eight or ten of the neighbors entered accompanied by two gendarmes. By this time the cries had ceased, but as the party rushed up the first flight of stairs, two or more rough voices in angry contention were distinguished and seemed to proceed from the upper part of the house. As a second landing was reached, these sounds also had ceased, and everything remained perfectly quiet. The party spread themselves and hurried from room to room, upon arriving at a large back chamber in the fourth story, the door of which, being found locked, with the key inside, was forced open. A spectacle presented itself which struck every one present, not less with horror than with astonishment. The apartment was in the wildest disorder, the furniture broken and thrown about in all directions. There was only one bedstead, and from this the bed had been removed and thrown into the middle of the floor. On the chair lay a razor, besmeared with blood. On the hearth there were two or three long and thick tresses of grey human hair, also dappled in blood, and seemed to have been pulled out by the roots. Upon the floor there were found four Napoleons, an earring of topaz, three large silver spoons, three smaller of metal dagger, 
and two bags containing nearly 4,000 francs in gold. The drawers of her bureau, which had stood open in the corner, had been apparently rifled, although many articles still remained in them. A small iron safe was discovered under the bed, not under the bedstead. It was open with a key still in the door. It had no contents beyond a few old letters and other papers of little consequence. Of Madame L'Espagne no traces were here seen, but an unusual quantity of soot being observed in the fireplace, a search was made in the chimney, and horrible to relate. The corpse of the daughter, head downward, was dragged therefrom. It having thus been forced up a narrow aperture for a considerable distance, the body was still quite warm. Upon examining it, many excorations were perceived, no doubt occasioned by the violence by which it had been thrust up and disengaged. Upon the face there were many severe scratches, and upon the throat dark bruises and deep indentations of fingernails, as if the deceased had been throttled to death. And after a thorough investigation of every portion of the house, without further discovery, the party made its way into a small paved yard in the rear of the building, where lay the corpse of the old lady, with her throat so entirely cut that, upon an attempt to raise her, the head fell off. The body as well as the head, was fearfully mutilated, the former so much so, scarcely to retain any semblance of humanity. To this horrible mystery there is not, as yet, we believe, the slightest clue. The next day's paper had these additional particulars. The tragedy in the Rue Morgue. Many individuals have been examined in relation to this most extraordinary and frightful affair. The word affair has not yet in France the levity of import which it conveys to us. But nothing whatever has transpired to throw light on. We give below all the material testimony elicited. Pauline Duberg, laundress, deposes that she had known both the deceased for three years, having washed for them during that period. The old lady and her daughter were seemed on good terms very affectionate towards each other, they were excellent pay, could not speak in regard to their mode or means of living, believed that Madame L. told fortunes for a living, was reputed to have money put by, never met any persons in the house when she was called for the clothes or took them home, was sure that they had no servant to employ. There appeared to be no furniture in any part of the building except the fourth story. Pierre Moreau, tobacconist, deposes that he had been in the habit of selling small quantities of tobacco and snuff to Madame L'Espagne for nearly four years, was born in the neighborhood, and had always resided there. The deceased and her daughter had occupied the house in which the corpses were found for more than six years. It was formerly occupied by a jeweler, who underlet the upper rooms to various persons. The house was the property of Madame L. She became dissatisfied with the abuse of her premises by her tenant, and moved into them herself, refusing to let any portion. The old lady was childish. Witnesses had seen the daughter some five or six times during the six years. The two lived an exceedingly retired life, were reputed to have money. It said among some of the neighbors that Madame L. told fortunes, did not believe it, had never seen any person enter the door except the old lady and her daughter, a porter once or twice, and a physician maybe some eight or ten times. Many of the persons, neighbors, gave evidence to the same effect. No one was spoken of as frequenting the house. It was not known whether there were any living connections of Madame L. and her daughter. The shutters of the front windows were seldom opened, and those in the rear were always closed, with the exception of the large back room fourth story. The house was a good house, not very old. Isidore Mousset, gendarme, disposes that he was called to the house about three o'clock in the morning, and found some twenty or thirty persons in the gateway endeavoring to gain admittance, forcing it open at length with a bayonet, not a crowbar. Had but little difficulty in getting it open on account of it being a double or folded gate, and bolted neither at the bottom nor at the top. The shrieks were continued until the gate was forced, and then suddenly ceased. There seemed to be screams of some person or persons in great agony, were long and drawn out, not short and quick. Witnesses led the way up the stairs. Upon reaching the first landing, 
heard two voices in loud and angry contention, the one a gruff voice and one much shriller, a very strange voice, could distinguish some words of the former, which was that of a Frenchman, was positive that it was not a woman's voice, could distinguish the words scar and dabble. The shrill voice was that of a foreigner, could not make sure if it was a voice of a man or a woman, could not make out what was said, but believed the language to be Spanish. The state of the room and the bodies were described by this witness as we described them yesterday. Henry Duval, a neighbor, and by trade a silversmith, deposes that he was one of the party who first entered the house, and corroborates the testimony of Doucette in general. As soon as they forced the entrance, they reclosed the door to keep out the crowd, which collected very fast, notwithstanding the lateness of the hour. The shrill voice, the witness thinks, was that of an Italian, was certain it was not French, could not be sure that it was a man's voice, it might have been a woman's, was not acquainted with the Italian language, could not distinguish the words, but was convinced that the intonation of the speaker was an Italian, knew Madame L. and her daughter, had conversed with them both frequently, was sure that the shrill voice was not that of either of the deceased. Odenheimer, restaurateur. This witness volunteered his testimony. Not speaking French, was examined by an interpreter. Is a native of Amsterdam, was passing the house at the time of the shrieks. They lasted for several minutes, probably ten. They were long and loud, very awful and distressing. Was one of those who entered the building. Corroborated the previous evidence in every respect but one. Was sure that the shrill voice was that of a man, of a Frenchman. Could not distinguish the words uttered. They were loud and quick, unequal. Spoken apparently in fear as well as anger. The voice was harsh. Not so much shrill as harsh. Could not call it a shrill voice. The gruff voice said repeatedly, Scar. Dabble, and once, mon Dieu, Jules Mignon, banker of the firm Mignon at Phil's, Rue de la Reine, is the elder Mignon. Madame L'Espagne had some property, had opened an account with his banking house in the spring of the year, eight years previously, made frequent deposits in small sums, had checked for nothing until the third day before her death, when she took out, in person, the sum of four thousand francs. The sum was paid in gold, and a clerk went home with the money. Adolphe Le Bon, clerk to Mignon at Phil's, deposes that on the day in question, about noon, he accompanied Madame L'Espagne to her residence with the four thousand francs put up in two bags. Upon the door being opened, Mademoiselle L. appeared and took from his hands one of the bags, while the old lady relieved him of the other. He then bowed and departed, did not see any person in the street at that time. It was a by-street, very lonely. William Byrd, Taylor, deposes that he was one of the party who entered the house, is an Englishman. He has lived in Paris for two years, was one of the first to ascend the stairs, heard the voices in contention. The gruff voice was that of a Frenchman, could make out several words, but cannot now remember all heard distinctly, scar and mon dieu. It was a sound at the moment as if several persons a struggling, a scraping and scuffling sound. The shrill voice was very loud, louder than the gruff one. It's sure that it was not the voice of an Englishman, appeared to be that of a German, might have been that of a woman's voice, does not understand German. Four of the above-named witnesses, being recalled, deposed that the door of the chamber in which the body of Mademoiselle L. was locked on the inside when the party reached it. Everything was perfectly silent, no groans or noises of any kind. Upon forcing the door, no person was seen. The windows, both of the back and front room, were down and firmly fastened from within. A door from between the two rooms was closed but not locked. The door leading from the front room into the passage was locked with the key on the inside. A small room in the front of the house on the fourth story at the head of the passage was open, the door being ajar. This room was crowded with old beds, boxes, and so forth. These were carefully removed and searched. There was not an inch of any portion of the house that was not carefully searched. Sweeps were sent up and down the chimneys. 
The house was a four-story one with garrets. A trap door in the roof was nailed down very securely and did not appear to have been opened for years. The time elapsing between the hearing of the voices in contention and the breaking open of the room door was variously stated by the witnesses. Some made it seem short as three minutes, some as long as five. The door was opened with difficulty. Alfonso Garcia, undertaker, deposes that he resides in the room morgue is a native of Spain, was one of the party who entered the house, did not proceed up the stairs, is nervous and was apprehensive of the consequences of agitation, heard the noises in contention. The gruff voice was that of a Frenchman, could not distinguish what was said. A shrill voice was that of an Englishman, is sure of this. Does not understand the English language, but judges by the intonation." Alberto Montani, confectioner, deposes that he was among the first to ascend the stairs, heard the voices in question. The gruff voice was that of a Frenchman, distinguished several words. The speaker appeared to be expostulating, could not make out all the words of the shrill voice, spoke quick and unevenly, thinks it was the voice of a Russian, corroborates the general testimony, is an Italian, and never conversed with a native of Russia. Several witnesses were called here, testified that the chimneys of all the rooms on the fourth story were too narrow to admit the passage of a human being. The sweeps were meant cylindrical sweeping brushes, such are employed by those who clean chimneys. These brushes were passed up and down every flue in the house. There was no back passage by which one could have descended while the party proceeded upstairs. The body of Mademoiselle La Spagna was so firmly wedged in the chimney that it could not be got down until four or five of the party united their strength. Paul Dumas, physician, deposes that he was called to view the bodies about daybreak. They were both then lying on the sacking of the bedstead in the chamber where Mademoiselle L. was found. The corpse of the young lady was much bruised and excoriated. The fact that it had been thrust up the chimney would sufficiently account for these appearances. The throat was greatly chafed. There were several deep scratches just below the chin, together with a series of livid spots, which were evidently the impressions of fingers. The face was fearfully discolored, and the eyeballs protruded. The tongue had been partially bitten through. A large bruise was discovered on the pit of the stomach, produced, apparently, by the pressure of a knee. In the opinion of Monsieur Dumas, Mademoiselle L'Espagne had been throttled to death by some person or persons unknown. The corpse of the mother was horribly mutilated. All the bones of the right leg and arm were more or less shattered, the left tibia much splintered, as well as all the ribs on the left side. Whole body dreadfully bruised and discolored. It was not possible to say how the injuries had been inflicted. A heavy club of wood, a broad bar of iron, a chair... Any large, heavy, and obtuse weapon would have produced such results, if wielded by the hands of a very powerful man. No woman could have inflicted these blows with any weapon. The head of the deceased, when seen by the witness, was entirely separated from the body and was also greatly shattered. The throat had evidently been cut by some very sharp instrument, probably with a razor. Alexander Etienne, surgeon, was called with Monsieur Dumas to view the bodies, corroborated the testimony and the opinions of Monsieur Dumas. Nothing farther of importance was elicited, although several other persons were examined. A murder so mysterious and so perplexing in all its particulars was never before committed in Paris, if indeed a murder has been committed at all. The police were entirely at fault. An unusual occurrence of affairs in this nature... There is not, however, a shadow of a clue apparent. The evening edition of the paper stated that the greatest excitement still continued in Quartier Saint Roche, that the premises in question had been carefully researched and fresh examinations of witnesses instituted, but all to no purpose. A postscript, however, mentioned that Adolphe Laban had been arrested and imprisoned although nothing appeared to criminate him beyond the facts already detailed. Dupin seemed singularly interested in the progress of the affair, 
At least so I judged from his manner, for he made no comments, and it was only after the announcement that Laban had been imprisoned that he asked me my opinion respecting the murders. I could merely agree with all Paris in considering them an unsolvable mystery. I saw no means by which it would be possible to trace the murderer. Thank you once again for joining us here today at the Patuxent General. If you'd like to reach out with a comment, question, recipe, or local ghost story, our email is jess at patuxentgeneral.com. Please reach out. We can't wait to hear from you, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. But until then, I'll meet you right back here next time at the Patuxent General. Something for Posterity Production, pre-recorded in Patuxent. <laughs>